Uh, so, welcome all, all to this uh, SIB Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to uh, host Fabio uh, Rinaldi, uh, who is a senior, uh, senior uh, researcher at the Institute of Computational Linguistics of the University of Zurich, where he coordinates the Ontogene project, which is a text mining project for the biomedical literature. <clears throat> Fabio holds a, a bachelor and a master in computer science obtained at the University of Udine in Italy, and he then worked in major uh, research centers, um, such as the Institute for Scientific and Technological Research in Italy, which is now the uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler, at the uh, Institute of, uh, for Integrated Publication and Information Systems in Germany, and at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology in the UK. Uh, in 2008, he completed his PhD in Computational Linguistics at the University of Zurich. And during his career, uh, Fabio has also been visiting different universities as a research visitor, uh, such as University of Colorado, University of Tokyo, University of Mexico, to name a few. And uh, now Fabio is working at the Institute of Computation and Linguistics at the ETH uh, Zurich since 2005, and is also affiliated to the uh, SIB since 2016. So uh, his group, which is called the uh, Biomex. Uh, uh, group is uh, specialized in information extraction from the biomedical le literature as well as other textual sources. Uh, information uh, extraction is an important component of text mining systems. And the group specializes in the extraction of domain specific entities such as, such as genes, proteins, drug disease, and the se their semantic relations, such as protein protein interaction, gene disease associations. And additionally, the group provides an, an environment for assisted curation, uh, which is currently being used in the creation pipeline of the Regulon database uh, uh, in a project funded by the US uh, NIH. So today, Fabio will tell us more about information extraction and uh, their application for biome biomedical knowledge discovery. So thank you again, Fabio, for accepting uh, to come over here. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much for this introduction. I'm surprised that you could find so much information about me, even things that I completely forgot. <laughs> but <laughs> thanks. And I uh, the information very well. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let me start. Uh, I have structured the presentation in four parts: uh, an introduction, a lot of large introduction that shows the problems that we are dealing with, some example applications. Then uh, I have a smaller part about the material we're dealing with, which is the, mainly the biomedical literature, although uh, the techniques that we use can potentially be applied to other forms of uh, textual uh, data. Uh, then I'll have a section about uh, our own research in this area, or especially recent research. Um, this part might be a bit less exciting for those who are not in this domain, in, text mining, but I, I hope to uh, keep your attention anyway. And uh, finally, I have a section about the projects. Uh, we are currently a uh, recent and current project, which where I hope again to be able to provide you some exciting material. Okay, so let's start with introduction. Uh, we compare uh, text mining, information extraction to conventional document search. This is done often, this kind of presentation, where in conventional document search, uh, basically, you enter keywords, and the system find documents that contain those keywords or are somehow relevant to those keywords. You're still left with the task of going through those documents and find the information that we are originally looking for. Suppose you were interested in causes of diabetes or uh, treatments of diabetes. Uh, the, you will get documents talking about those things, but still you have to go through these documents. Uh, the idea about you know, text mining, which is sort of a more general uh, term for which covers also information extraction, is that starting from uh, various forms of text, books, publications, other sources as well, uh, we will be able to create uh, information, inform structured information, in the forms of entities like proteins, genes, diseases, interactions among them. Uh, by the way, this picture comes from this online tool, which uh, uh, has been running for several years, I think since 2004, and attempts to do do this kind of, uh, uh, create this kind of structure. So text mining is defined, has been defined uh, 
several times. Uh, for example, this definition is uh, often cited by Marty Ears. Uh, discover by computer of new, new, previously unknown information by automatically extracting information from different written sources. Key element is linking together the extracted information to form new facts or new hypotheses to be further explored. And so it's a very ambitious goal. How do we find new unknown information? Uh, well, uh, that citation comes from, a, say, a, 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 an article by Mark Earth in a, in a, in a uh, say, uh, magazine where she was um, briefly describing the result that she previously presented in this, uh, in, in this paper that was presented in, at the, at the uh, ACL, which is the Conference of the Association of Computational Linguistics in 1999. And it's strange because the application she was dealing with and presented at the Conference of the Association of Computational Linguistics is an uh, application in the biomedical domain. And basically she was saying that what we want to do is to solve some problems in molecular biology. For example, find the functions of novel genes by finding relationships with other known genes. For example, we have some features of the unknown gene, newly discovered genes, which are similar to features of known genes, and we look uh, for information about those known genes and find potential suggestions for the function of the unknown genes by association with the known genes. Um, and I think this is very important. The emphasis of the system is to automate the tedious parts of text manipulation and integrate computational driven analysis with human guided decision making. And this is an important bit, the human guided decision making. The system is not making decisions. The human is making decisions. The system is providing suggestions. Uh, that was an uh, experimental application. Really making sense. Okay, so I think the definition of Mark Erst is based on, on, uh, on an earlier idea that uh, was already published in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, theorized by uh, uh, Don Swanson. Uh, which he called a literature-based discovery. Um, this is the days before PubMed, so they didn't have a lot of literature available, and most of the work by uh, Swanson was uh, manual, basically. But basically, the, the fundamental idea was that if we are interested in a connection between an entity A, say an illness, and, a, and an entity C, for example, a drug, and we don't know, uh, we don't have any explicit evidence of this connection. But maybe we have evidence of connection of illness A with chemical B, with enzyme X, and with gene Y. At the same time, we find connection of drug C with the same entities. Then we could hypothesize that there is a connection between the two. That was the idea of Transform. And in fact, he tested this method with, um, in a number of cases, he had a few publications at the time, a famous example here, connection between migraine and magnesium, basically it took these facts from titles of PubMed paper, like stress associated with migraine, stress is lead to the loss, to, to, to loss of magnesium. So here we have a connection to stress. Calcium channel blockers prevent migraine, and magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. And again, another connection to uh, the calcium channel blocker, and so on with other examples. So through these connections, he was able to hypothesize potential unknown not yet uh, proven relationship between different entities. And in fact, I think a couple of his hypotheses were then proven experimentally. Um, I think this, uh, I, I prefer to call this kind of approach literature-based discovery. And I, 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 I take it as going beyond text mining. So for me, text mining is uh, really the techniques behind, the techniques of text processing that allow this, to go towards this kind of approaches. And uh, um, for my preferred definition is this one. It's the ability to, text mining is the ability to process unstructured text, typically a large set of documents, interpret the meaning, and automatically extract concepts, as well as relationships among those concepts. So uh, um, find entities, objects that are relevant in the particular domain, biology, in this case could be genes, diseases, experimental methods, connect them through relationships, and use this information extracted from the literature 
for applications. Applications could be assisted curation, knowledge base creation or update, question answer. I'm discussing a couple of examples later. Um, and here we have a vision paper from uh, Andrei Rodzewski in uh, 2009 where he basically says that starting from the literature, applying information instruction, you get these objects from the literature, these entities, the relationships among them, and we could use them in uh, different types of application, like question answering, like uh, studying temporal trends, uh, evolution, uh, the evolution of a field over time, by seeing uh, what things have been talked about more or less over time. Um, so, uh, the information instruction step, which is the, one of the top, uh, delivers uh, phrases which link entities to pred predicates, like uh, enzyme activates uh, or RNA uh, uh, upregulates or downregulates a protein, say. Um, the, uh, this, these facts can be then stored in a database and, uh, and, and, and this is the material on which then uh, data mining techniques can, can work. And we could maybe find even conflicting facts because some experiments, the literature might not be reliable. Uh, and by say, seeing that some facts, are some a relation between A and B is positive in the majority of cases and negative only in a few cases, then we could hypothesize that the cases where it's negative are, might be errors. Um, and the goal would be potential goal, long-term goal, construct a map of science, a global description of the relationships between all those entities. Now, I've talked about information extraction. Let me explain with examples from another domain uh, what is information extraction. This is a classical example from a series of lectures and uh, and basically, information instruction is a, an approach and method that is, was born about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and uh, there were competition called the Message Understanding Conferences. And the goal was to get from text some structured representation of some essential content of that text. And here you see the steps, uh, the essential steps are done. Rec recognize the fact that there are names of people here recognizes the fact that there are names of organizations, and words that express a relationship between those persons and those organizations. We collect these facts without doing any kind of deep processing, within, without trying to understand in detail the text, just getting this elementary information from it, and try to, to combine that to create a database that shows the relationship between these objects. This is the idea of information structure. The first step is called named entity recognition, and then relation instruction, and then the construction of a database. And the same idea can be applied in several domains. And my work focuses on the biomedical domain. So where does this lead us to? Uh, what can we get with these techniques? Well, this is an example of a widely used commercial application of biomedical text mining. I flunked here the name of the product because it's a commercial product. But if anyone in the public uh, has worked at a pharmaceutical company, probably they recognize it because it's been sold and sold to many pharmaceutical companies and they pay a lot of money to be able to mine the literature in this way. This, this tool is, uh, is um, uh, well, you recognize different types of entities. It can be customized in several ways. And, uh, and it's rule-based. You can write specific rules that will recognize relationships among the entities. Yeah, in, this, in this case, it's an application to, to uh, chemical substances, uh, or medical uh, me medicines, I think, uh, chemical substances that have a medical relevance, and, um, and you see quantities have been recognized here. And it's, 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 that the tool is also able to recognize synonyms. Algo CB uh, has been recognized as synonym of algo pyridol. Um, this is also an important problem, the fact that there are different names for the same things, for the same objects. Another example, uh, this uh, again a commercial tool, it come, I believe it comes from a research institute, but I believe they, they sell it commercially. Uh, and so again, I omit the name. And basically, you see the idea is to be able to intertest, uh, in the text to uh, recognize different types 
of entities could be uh, important for understanding uh, quickly what the document is about. Uh, yeah, we have some diseases, breast cancer, uh, here we have proteins, uh, BCRP, uh, sorry the picture here, the full resolution, and, and then we associate these fragments of text that we have recognized to some reference. And the references could be in a database. For example, we could go to recognize a gene, we could go to enter a gene, and provide a link to the entry and intro gene that correspond to that piece of text. And uh, again, for each entity, we would probably find some reference. Okay, so the, what do we need in order to be able to uh, implement a solution like that? Well, now it comes a bit, uh, part, the part which is a bit more technical. Uh, and uh, um, what it comes to, well, we need to use techniques from uh, my field of origin, which is in computational linguistic, natural language processing. Well, uh, what you're seeing might appear easy at the first sight, but it is not. Um, there are different levels of analysis that we might need to perform in order to find what we need to find. And here I have listed some. First of all, we need to identify the sentences. Again, seems trivial, but sometimes it's not. A dot not always means the end of the sentence. It could be an abbreviation. It could be uh, something else, and, uh, and uh, I, 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 I've read that in, in, in some cases, in some papers, there are sentences which start with lowercase letters, so you cannot really rely, rely even on, on, the, on the case. It starts with the name of an entity, name of a gene that needs to be written lowercase, and you don't have, even have the clue that, uh, that, that the sentence should start with an uppercase letter. So, um, easy but not trivial. Uh, tokenization. Uh, tokenization means finding the word split it and text into words. And uh, again, you might think it is trivial, but um, it's not always the case. For example, take BCL2 here. Is the hyphen, should we split the hyphen or not? In this case, probably we don't want to split it in two parts. But there are cases where the hyphen separates two syntactic items and that we need to split. Again, seems easy, but there are a lot of uh, tricky cases, so uh, a lot of uh, attention needs to be paid off in order to to do it appropriately. Uh, we need to recognize abbreviations. Uh, coreference. Coreference means that we are talking in a sentence about something we mentioned before. For example, we mentioned a protein, and we could say this protein something. And so if we are looking at connection between uh, the protein that was mentioned in the previous sentence and uh, in, the current, in the current sentence, we have say, the function of the protein, some properties of the protein, we need to be able to make this connection. And again, it's not obvious because this reference is not always, a, it, there is not always a single possible antecedent, a single possible reference. And so uh, there could be other entities that are mentioned just before that one. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a well known problem in uh, natural language processing. Um, then, so here you see different steps of uh, text analysis. And here at the top you see. Uh, the steps of, uh, say, conceptual analysis. Recognizing the fact that some of these words represent entities of the domain, objects that are of interest to us. Uh, like this one represents uh, something of interest, this one, and, uh, and this one. But then here, yeah, in this case, it's not even clear what we want to pick. Is it the blood cell, the white blood cell, the white blood cell death? Uh, all of them could be uh, relevant concepts. And, um, and for each of them, we could find probably some kind of identifier in a database. Once we have found a segment that represents an entity of interest like this one, the problem is not finished because BCL2, if we look it up in, in a database, we probably find several identifiers that correspond to that entry. If we look at it in, in Uniprox, say. And uh, what is the correct one? What is the one meant in this position in the text? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is a problem of concept recognition, we call concept recognition. And, and the most and complex problem, which is not shown here, would be that of relation structure, finding the fact that this sentence expressed some kind of relation between these three entities, BCL2, B553, and the white blood cell death, death, and exactly what relationship is being expressed. So an approach, a possible approach that has been um, tested several times is to use some syntactic analysis. This part of the figure represent a syntactic analysis of this sentence. And I'll show you another type of syntactic analysis later. So these are all techniques that can be used towards building 
uh, information extraction system. We don't need to always, uh, we don't need always to use all of them. For example, if you're only interest, interested in finding the entities, you're not interested in relational extraction, probably would not do, do all this part. Uh, it would be an overkill. Okay, so um, information extraction has been, uh, uh, information extraction and text mining have been uh, a popular topic of, uh, for applications of uh, interbiomedical domain for uh, several years. And uh, given the relevance, given the fact that there is so much information to, how to be found in the literature, there have been attempts to evaluate how well information extraction, how well text mining to, uh, technologies do. And these evaluations are typically organized in the form of competitions, where organizers provide some task for the participants to be solved. For example, find all the gene names in these papers. The organizer provides a set of papers, and participants have to find all the gene names mentioned in those papers. And um, the first of those competitions, to my knowledge, is, uh, was organized in 2003, uh, an information extraction task as part of the KDD Cup. Um, what the system, what participants had to build systems to, to, a, to help the fly-based curation process. Um, then there has been the track genomic track that is more about uh, information retrieval, that is finding documents that contain information that is relevant to a given problem. The bio NLP competitions that aim at uh, finding complex relationships between entities. And the bio-creative competitions, which have focused more on the well, finding entities, finding some types of relations, and the relevance of these techniques to curation, to database curation. Okay, now, uh, I have mentioned, let's say, historical, if you want, of uh, some of well-known uh, biomedical text mining systems that are still up and running. Um, Techpresso is used uh, in the curation pipeline of some databases. Um, Chilibot is an application which allows you to find, uh, to mine the literature for relationship between biomedical entities. HIOP is similar, so focusing more on proteins. And, um, and what is it is another one uh, which is um, provided by the EBI in Cambridge. So as an example, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but as an example, this is Chilibot. And in Chilibot, you can enter and then some names of entities. For example, you can enter one, two, or three entities, or number of entities. Uh, in this case, this is an example I tested yesterday. I've entered this, this, um, this, this protein names and process name, apoptosis, and names of proteins. And what the system has found is gone through the literature, has found sentences that mention those entities, computed how often a relationship between those two entities is present in the literature, and created a graph which represents as, uh, the uh, uh, co-occurrence of those entities in the literature. Here, for example, we see that uh, the system, well, there is a limit, probably, uh, how many papers the system goes through. But um, uh, this is, for example, a connection between apoptosis uh, and create Eight. And if you click on any of these relationships, the system will show you the sentences that uh, mention that relationship. In this case, I've clicked on uh, uh, sorry, CREB and, uh, and uh, CAS3, I think. And uh, uh, yes, CREB and CAS3. And the system has uh, shown me some sentences that mention the two expressing some relation. The system also tries to determine what type of relationship is present between there's a positive or negative relationship between the two, the two entities. Okay, now, uh, I've shown you the vision, I've shown you the, uh, some applications, some tools as examples. Uh, let me tell you what is the starting material of all this work. And the starting material is the biomedical literature. We can do all this, uh, or try to do all this uh, literature-based discovery, text mining, only because we have access to uh, a rich source, uh, the biomedical literature. Um, the um, well-known repository of bio, um, biomedical literature references is uh, Medline, which currently contains 27 million references, and it grows very fast. 
at, at, the, at the moment, there are about two publications per million added to PubMed. So it is often argued that keeping track with this amount of publications is impossible for humans, and that is uh, presented as a reason to use text mining technologies, because uh, humans will never be able to keep up with this amount of information. Um, of those 27 million, about 1.5 million are available as, uh, maybe this is a bit outdated, I, I think it's more now. I have another slide about, uh, um, uh, I think it's 4.5 million are available as full text in PubMed Central. PubMed Central, is, as you know, is a version of PubMed where you get the article in full text. Um, so we take this for granted now. We take for granted the fact that we have access to the literature. But it's actually not uh, uh, that long that we get that access. So let me tell you a bit of history, just uh, for curiosity. So Medline originated in, uh, from, uh, from the National Library of Medicine, and the, 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 the first uh, version, if you want, it was a printed version. In 18, started in 1879, they started to print an index of uh, biomedical literature called Index Medical. And they kept publishing this until 2004, then stopped for obvious reasons. Um, in 1964, they went digital, creating a digital index. In 1971, this index was made uh, available to, uh, to network connections for remote access, for libraries, from libraries, for example. So from a university library, you could access uh, this index, get information about publication. And they boasted that they could, they could support as many as 25 users at the same time. Uh, of course, that was another age. Uh, in, only in 1997, uh, they, uh, when what the internet was available, the web was available, uh, PubMed started uh, with the idea of making it accessible to everyone, the literature, the scientific literature. But mind you, PubMed makes available only the abstracts and the abstract contains only a little amount of information because we like to have access to the full papers. Um, before I get to the full papers, uh, it is also often um, said that uh, PubMed grows uh, at an exponential rate. I, I take that normally to mean that it grows very fast. But somebody has actually tried to fit an exponential curve on the growth of PubMed. So in this paper, Anton Cohen, 2006, they took the, the total entries in PubMed over time the period of time and the new entries, and they split the two exponential curves on it. So I'm not sure that fits for, for the entire duration of PubMed, and, and I, I personally believe it would be impossible to be an, an exponential growth forever, but, but um, and certainly it's, it's a very intensive growth of publications. Okay, so now coming to open access, um, the open access movement is more recent. Uh, in 2003, there was the Bethesda statement on open access publishing that basically said that um, the literature being, especially those, uh, the literature coming out of research funded by public money should be open to the public. It's also logic and uh, expected. Uh, but it wasn't the case for a long time. A follow-up was the Berlin Declaration, just the same year. And just the next year, uh, PubMed Central started with the aim of making available uh, full text papers. Uh, so currently there are 4.6 million articles. So the previous 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 uh, number was outdated, uh, 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 and they have about 2,000 full participation journals. Full participation journals are journals that agree with PubMed to make available all their publications full text to PubMed Central, and there are 4,800 uh, par partial participation participation journals. Those are journals that make available a section, uh, some of their articles or make available their articles with a delay. They say, for example, the, in, within six months, uh, they can the article go to Palmer Central, or within one year, they go, go to Palmer Central. Okay, so those 4.6 million articles is quite a lot. It's almost 10% of, of the entire uh, PubMed. And you think we might be happy with those, but in fact, uh, open access doesn't necessarily mean they are completely free. Uh, within PubMed Central, there is a subset of articles called the, called the open access subset. It contains about 1.8 million articles at the moment, which is articles which are made available with a uh, Creative Commons license. It means that are free to use for several purposes. What is the difference? 
these articles, you can read them. You're free to read them. The article is open access subset. You can do more with them. For example, you can process them automatically. Now you will think, why? I mean, if, if these are available, why can you process it then? Well, the reason is the publisher often have a, a, a little a, intercontracts in a, a point of saying that uh, even if you can, it, even if you can read them, so if your library, the nearest library, paid a lot of money to get the article, uh, you're not free to process them automatically. And I think this kind of uh, limitation is restricting the potential of uh, applications uh, to discover knowledge in the literature. And I think actually it would be a good initiative for the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics to try to change, uh, to push for a change in the law in Switzerland that uh, would make such kind of clauses illegal. And this has happened in the UK, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, some people working in tax mining uh, uh, have petitioned the parliament and the law has been changed. And it's actually logical because research is, in public, uh, is produced by projects funded by public money. We pay the publishers to, to publish this and then uh, we are not even free to do whatever we want with this article. So this will be, an, I think, an important initiative, try to, to change this, this aspect so that all the literature should be free and accessible for, for whatever purpose that uh, we might want, uh, uh, whatever scientific purpose. Okay, now, Parliament Central was created with the goal and stated here to integrate the literature with a variety of other information, such as databases, uh, the intentional and synthetic discoveries that such links might foster, excite us, and stimulate us to move forward. So actually, this was the statement when PubMed Central was created. So the initiators of PubMed Center had in mind the idea that we could link the literature and database and create a rich knowledge sources from this combination. Um, from 2005, uh, the NIH uh, required all uh, projects funded by them to uh, uh, produce open access versions of their scientific uh, output. And so submit to PubMed Center. And, and uh, by the way, just today, the Swiss National Science Foundation has sent out an announcement saying that they have introduced the same rule. That is, all research funded by the SNF will have to be published in open access form. I think this was long overdue. It's a good initiative. Um, but uh, still many publications are not open access. Uh, a lot of publishers have these kind of clauses that I mentioned before that restrict the possibility to process the literature. And I think it's uh, time to change, and I hope that uh, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics um, does something to uh, change the situation. I would be happy to, to uh, uh, coordinate such an initiative. Um, okay, now, uh, let me tell you something about my research. So in order to do this kind of uh, implement a system, build this kind of system that find entities and relationships in the literature or in other text, for, uh, text uh, sources, uh, we need to find the entities first, the items of interest in the domain. So our approach, the approach that we follow in my group, is based on sourcing information from several databases. Take many of the um, SIB resources, some SIB resources, and several others, the NIH and CBI resources. And basically, we fetch from those databases the terminology that defines the entities that we want. So every entry in, say, Uniprot would have names for the proteins. We take those names and the corresponding identifiers, and we put all of them together. We have created an interface that you see here where uh, a user can go and say, well, I want uh, terms from the cell ontology, from the KB, from my entry gene, say. Uh, you can, uh, the system also, when you open the page, will check if there has been an update of in any of those resources since the last time we downloaded it. So you can always get the most up-to-date version of this resource. So select what you want, and then basically, you can download a simplified uh, a file in a simpli very simple format, which contains the terminology. Uh, from those databases. Of course, there is a lot of information, other information in those databases, which we don't need for text processing. 
But what we want to keep is, the, as I said, the name, aliases of the terms, and their IDs. Keeping their IDs allows us always to go back to the original entry if we want to find more information about that entry. Uh, we also studied then the properties of the terminology that we, were, that we obtained from these databases. For example, this is a study of the ambiguity of terms in different categories. Um, these, are, uh, these are, for example, two, the cell lines and chemicals. And um, this is a logarithmic scale. And what these graphs indicate is that, for example, for cell lines, almost 50,000 of them uh, are unique. There is a unique correspondence between name and identifier. There is no ambiguity. Well, this one shows that uh, chemicals are a lot more ambiguous. Uh, there are a lot of cases where the same name corresponds to two identifiers, or one identifier has two names, or more than two. And so this is, will be easy to process, basically, for a text mining system. This will be difficult to process for a text mining system. Uh, this table shows the same pro problem, uh, and shows that the problem is particularly uh, big in uh, genes and proteins, where, in average, Every uh, identifier has, uh, sorry, every term can correspond to up to 1.33 identifiers. Uh, there are, as you know, genes and proteins that, given a name, you find hundreds of identifiers. In average, so many. So, this ambiguity in those cases is very difficult. The opposite case is shown here, where we have diseases where, for an identifier, there are several terms, several synonyms. So there are different names for the same object. This is not a problem for tax mining system, but this is instead a big problem. Uh, this, shows, this table shows another type of problem, the ambiguity across different terminologies. So the previous problem was ambiguity within a single terminology. This is the problem of ambiguity between different terminologies. And we see, as for example, that uh, cellular components overlap up to 55% with gene and protein. This means that the names that are used to, uh, in paper to mention uh, cellular components, uh, well, half of them could be also the name of a protein or a gene. Uh, for a cell line, up to 67 could be names of protein or gene. So when we see that name, it will not be obvious if it is now the cell line being mentioned or the gene being mentioned. And this is the problem that we, biggest problem we have to solve, the ambiguity of those names. And there are some cases which are very easy. So, what we do with all this terminology we develop as part of studying the properties of the, ter the terms? Well, we, we have also implemented an annotation system. Uh, this is uh, called OGRE, ont Ontogene Entity Recognition. Basically, uh, you can go here and you will find a web interface where you can enter some PubMed ID or PubMed Central ID or some free text and, and select some terminologies and the tool will annotate the document that you present. But this can be used just as a demo to show uh, what the system does on a specific case. But it could also be used as a web service. In the same page, you will find uh, indications on how to use this as a web service. As a web service, it means that you could build an application on a remote client that just sends batch of documents to this uh, server and we get them back an annotated version of those documents. And we have different input and output formats. Uh, so we have implemented this with the RESTful web interfaces, no interface, and we have also evaluated this service in um, competition, text mining competition, some of those that I mentioned before. Um, so these are the input and output formats that we have. We have PubMed, PubMed Central format of free, no, sorry, these, these are the types of inputs. The formats are text and is input, free text, a BIOC, which is a format that has been defined for biomedical text mining, XML format, PXML, which is in the form of, of uh, PubMed Central, uh, TSV, tab separated values, simple formats, and this is a visualization, very visualization, visualization tool, format for very tool. Visualization tool. Um, we have also a disambiguation uh, implemented on top of the, of the system, which I mentioned in a moment. But the disambiguation service is not yet integrated into the uh, web service. So what you get from the web service at the moment is only the uh, plain terminology lookup, basically. We have the marking up of all the entities in text. Um, as I said, we have tested this in competition in last April, uh, where the goal was to, to provide 
uh, named entity recognition system for several different types of entities and, uh, and uh, organizers evaluated different systems. In this case, evaluation was about efficiency of this system. As you see, see yeah, we did uh, quite well in several metrics. Uh, we did, uh, we were the best. And the way we implemented this, this is just a technicality, is that uh, the system receives a request from uh, the remote uh, client and then can distribute those requests to different workers, which would then combine the results and uh, uh, give uh, the uh, annotations back. Okay, as I said, the first part of the system, the ogre does the entity recognition. That's what you see here. But um, um, the next problem is to correctly assign an identifier to each span of text. We have seen a moment ago that entities are very ambiguous. There are a lot of ambiguities between a single class and across different classes. For example, if we look at HLC here, we can find a protein that corresponds to it, a, a gene ontology term, or another protein, or a KB term. So that name there could mean different things. Of course, in that particular context, it will have a specific meaning. But how would the machine recognize that meaning automatically? What is the correct interpretation? Well, we have tried to implement system that solve that problem, but before, I go to the system, let me show you some examples of why this problem is so big. Uh, name of genes. This is the name of gene. Was is the name of gene. And if we continue, we can, can probably find for almost every English word a gene or a protein that uses that word. So it will be, uh, if we would do this in a naive way, it wouldn't work. Uh, now some funny gene names, probably you have seen some of this list. I, I can tell you a story, but in the interest of time, I skipped the stories about the gene, funny gene names. Um, an exam another example of ambiguity is the cat. Cat is basically an animal. Is, uh, but it could be an uh, experimental method. It could mean computerized axial tomography. And of course, if, if you search it in, uh, in Android gene, then you find several genes that are, uh, they have this opposition. So recognizing them, uh, recognizing and interpreting the entity correctly is not that easy. So what we, have tried, what, we, what we have tried to do in my group is to implement a machine learning approach which will uh, disambiguate those annotations, try to find the correct interpretation. Uh, we have uh, tested this on a manually annotated corpus. A corpus has been created by a group in uh, the University of Colorado. Uh, called, it's called, the corpus is called Craft. They basically manually annotated 67 articles. So in those 67 articles, they went through every single mention of gene diseases, et cetera, and marked it up as with the correct interpretation. And what we try to do is to replicate that kind of work automatically. Could we do it? Could we? And uh, we have a paper recently published that shows that with help of several uh, features that, 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 um, that so describe the type of terms that we deal with, we are able to achieve uh, state-of-the-art results. State of the art results basically mean that we have, on this particular uh, case, uh, annotation in this corpus, we have the best results published so far. And these are a, a precision of 86% over all the terms that we deal with, a recall, best recall of 66%, and best F score of 70%. This is the problem of finding entities. Just finding for each span of text is this a gene, is this a disease, is this whatever it is. The next problem is, as explained, once you have that span of text, what is the correct ID? And for this our second problem, we get, uh, which is much more difficult, because you have a lot more IDs, we have uh, this, 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 we have this result. So about 50% in precision recall and F-score. It doesn't seem much, but it's the best uh, available so far. Um, Okay, and then we are trying now in current experiments to improve on that by using information that uh, is available in, uh, in, in, in uh, so there are cases which are unambiguous, several cases which are unambiguous. Maybe we can use those cases to help solve the cases which are ambiguous. We are trying to learn of this. This is current work. Okay, but um, this was just the latest result. We have been doing this, working in this area for more than a decade now, and we had several of these uh, results. Uh, we have participated in several competitions. We have obtained best results, for example, in, already in 2006, we had the best system finding experimental methods. 
in 2009, best system finding protein point interactions, and in another case in 2011, best system finding uh, several type of entities. Okay, and uh, conclude this part, uh, and then if you give me another five minutes, I'll show you my current projects. To conclude this part, what we have, uh, this part of my current research, we have systems for name identity recognition and concept identification, which are state of the art, and called the Biotherm Hub, or they're publicly accessible. You're welcome to test them and see that, send us feedback. And um, uh, only warning, the disambiguation, which I mentioned, is not yet included in the web service. As soon as it is included, uh, well, I, want, I hope that we will have it very soon included also in the web service. Okay, now, a quick overview of my projects where we apply those things. So that was the sort of basic research, fundamental research that we do. And where do we apply those things? Quick overview. We had a project in collaboration with the veterinary faculty of the University of Bern, uh, where we looked at uh, pathology reports. Pathology reports of, uh, so the veterinary, the farmers bring dead animals to the veterinary clinic to be examined to find what, what the animal had. And the, the veterinary doctor writes a report in, uh, in a free text in German, in this case. And this free, free, doc, free text document can contain every sort of thing. This is one disease. It's the intestinal torsion. And you see there can be misspellings there. There can be spelling correct variants of the same term. There can be eponyms of the term and inflections of the term. So again, we are confronted with the problem. If we want to find all the instances of this disease, we have to be able to say automatically that these are all the same or close. And in order to do that, we have to examine the terminology and recognize the similarity. And we do it to some extent automatically. Uh, we connect then those terminologies to uh, standard resources. Here we have terms that we extracted automatically from the pathology reports, and here we have a standard resource, the Universal Medical Language System of the, uh, of the uh, National Library of Medicine, and we basically try to find the connections between the terms that we find and the concepts that are represented in the UMLS. This way we can build bridge it between uh, terminology and a conceptual representation of the content of the text. And this then, this, all this analysis is then used by, uh, by our partners at the veterinary faculty in order to study those diseases, the diseases of those animals. We have built a classifier that basically classifies each report according to a set of categories of disease. They have created a set of categories uh, for the two animals that were studied, uh, cow and pig, and, uh, and the automatic classifier classified the reports according to if it is a disease of the intestinal system, if it is a disease of the uh, reproductive system or whatever. So we have an automatic classification of those and they use this and results of this classification to do uh, epidemiological studies to see uh, where some diseases are appearing and also so, uh, geographically and temporal. Uh, when maybe there are some anomalies. These diseases are mostly seasonal, but maybe sometimes you notice an anomaly in the trend, and you might hypothesize that there is some kind of problem, some kind of epidemic going on. Okay, so this is one project. Another project I'm involved in is mining the literature to find information about causes of psychological diseases. And, uh, and uh, th there can be a lot of causes of psychological disorders. And the challenge here is to define or to find all those different cases. It's, it's so va varied, the possibilities. And, uh, and uh, basically, we have created a corpus, a small corpus, where we have manually annotated the relationship between uh, diseases and potential causes, panic attacks, say, alcohol abuse, abuse and smoking, potential causes of significant predictors of panic attacks, and, and so on. And this information from this corpus is then used to train a system that should recognize automatically similar cases. And this again can be used to study temporal trends. Like here, we see in the literature, uh, over time, mentions of different disorders. This, these trends could also be reflect a change in the terminology that's been used rather than some kind of trend in the real diseases, in the occurrence of the diseases. And the most complex type of uh, problem to solve would be to find the relation between the causes in the gene and the, and the disease. And here we use the kind of deep analysis that I mentioned before. 
This was not, uh, not actually used in this project. I mentioned it is as an example of potential uh, deep application of uh, natural language processing to the literature. This is the kind of syntactic tree that uh, represents the syntactic structure of the sentence. And through the syntactic structure, we are able to recognize the fact that uh, the sentence expresses a particular type of relations that involves the two entities. Another project I'm involved in collaboration with an industrial partner, so a big pharma company, so I cannot say too much. But basically the problem that we deal with is finding whether two names of two authors are the same. So this is Sherlock Holmes, S. Holmes, the same as this one. Uh, sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you don't even have the affiliation information, or the affiliation has changed, and so it's very difficult. And we are trying to find out the, the, the develop automatic way. To, on the basis of the, what they work on, or what they publish, the content of their text, whether they can be, they might be the same person or not. And another project which has already started, but our, our own contribution it will be start in a couple of months, is um, is in the NRP 74 uh, framework, um, uh, smart healthcare, and it's a partnership with uh, a number of partners, also Ian Lausanne and, Gen and Geneve, and uh, and uh, five Swiss hospitals where we will analyze, sorry, electronic health records and try to find information about uh, reactions to antithrombotic drugs. This is a limited uh, uh, case, a study, to show the potential of uh, analyzing electronic health records. And by the way, talking of el electronic health records, I, I, I want to mention this uh, as an example. This is a paper published in, by, uh, by researchers in Denmark where they have access to all electronic records. So six, six million electronic records of all patients in Denmark uh, over a number of years. And, and by studying those electronic records, they were able to make predictions about the evolution of diseases over time. Where you start from some kind of disease, then maybe you get some kind of treatment, and then something else happens and happens. And we see this open up happening over and over again, especially to all patients. They get, they get medicine and they get something else, a problem, they go again to the hospital, and it gets worse and worse. And, and, and knowing this fact is very important to improve the treatment of the patient. And but sometimes, by looking on a few cases, the medical doctor might don't, not have the full picture. If we had all the cases, we could process all the cases, and with a lot more information. And it would be great if we had the same accessibility in Switzerland that there is in Denmark to electronic health records. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, for obvious reasons, there is a lot of restriction. So one way to uh, make them more available for research is so-called data, data identification. Remove all personal information from medical records uh, so that they can be made accessible for research. And that's another project in which I'm involved, trying to identify uh, electronic health records. And, uh, and finally, I want to conclude with this application, Assisted Curation. This is the collaboration with the Regulon DB group in Mexico, the project funded by the NIH. Uh, we have been proposing uh, for many years the idea that text mining technology can help the process of curation of databases. And I personally had a lot of, a few negative experiences where I tried to promote this idea and the reaction, we don't need it, we're doing fine <laughs> from, uh, from a database curators, which, which is, um, I mean, uh, of course, uh, the quality of a manual curation should not be touched, and we don't want to touch it. But I believe that uh, text mining technologies can help to make the process more efficient. And uh, I, in this example, in this collaboration with the Regulon DB uh, group, what we do is uh, uh, try to help them find more efficiently the information that they need. So the regular DB is a database that curates regula uh, regulation in E. coli. They have cases like this. Uh, so finding the literature information like, we additionally found that the expression of MTP gene is upregulated by manganese through MTR. So what do we have here? We have uh, MTR, from uh, transcription factor, I think it is, which promotes the expression of MTP. So we have an upper regulation of these two. This was a fact manually curated. So they read 6,000 papers, they found similar sentences, they found similar facts, and stored them in the database. Now in the database, they don't keep track of information where that was found, which sentence. They only, some, often, they, but not always, they tell us in which paper it was found, but not exactly where in the paper. Now the next problem they were facing that, well, it might be useful 
to know what was the experimental condition that was associated with that interaction. And for all the interactions that they have, how do they find the experimental condition? Do they have to read again those six thousand papers to find the experimental condition? Well, uh, together with them, basically we developed an alternative solution based on text mining. And the idea is shown here. I have this interface called Odin, which shows, shows an article annotated with terminology. So the same kind of ideas that have been discussing all, all, at the time, up to now. Only the terminology, specific terminology that is used here, is the one coming from the database. So we are taking the terminology used in the regular DB database, annotating uh, the 6,000 papers that they had already read, and then trying to find automatically in those 6,000 papers the sentences that express that those relationships that now they want to enrich with the information about the experimental condition. And in this experiment that's been published already a couple of years ago, 2014, we were able to do that. We were able to show that this information can be found efficiently, reliably, and once they found that sentence, they can locate very easily the experimental condition next to it. And therefore, this helped them more, uh, to get, uh, to increase the quality of the database in, 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 in a much more efficient way. Now in the database, they have the scroll conditions, which were not there before, associated with different types of interactions. You have the, 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 the type of conditions that are shown here. And, and, and basically then, the, the conclusion of this experiment is that uh, technology like this, uh, technologies like, like those that I've shown, can help make the process more efficient without having any impact on the quality. Because at the end, it's always the database curator who, take, who takes the decision. The system doesn't take the decision. The take, system makes only a suggestion. Or it provides information that guides, guides the curator towards uh, what he needs to find. Um, we also continue, continue now this work. We are trying to integrate these different technologies into the curation pipeline. And we are continuing this work in the scope of the NIH pro, uh, funded project. And now, finally, come to a conclusion, a bit late. Uh, these are the people who work with me. Uh, uh, Len Furra, Tilly Allendorf, Nico College, and Anne Goring. And I was also to thank the uh, people of the Regulon DB group that uh, uh, are very important. Uh, so, Yalvi Baldera, Toto Gamma Castro, Oscar Litto, and most important, last name on the list, uh, Julio Collado Vides, the leader of the group in uh, Cuernavaca in Mexico, who basically is the leader of the Regulon DB group. And, uh, uh, form, and I met. Uh, them at some conference, bio-curation conferences, and meeting them has been very important for me because, uh, 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 as you have seen, my background is entirely in NLP, computational linguistic computer science. I don't have a background in biology. I've been trying to promote my approaches to biologists, to database curator, without much success for a long time. And I'm really grateful that uh, Julio was a uh, 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 welcome me and, uh, and, and we work together. And the, 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 probably the reason why he, he, he was interested in my work is there's also a strong interest in, in languages, in, in language processing. He has some kind of background. So uh, that, that was an important thing in my life. Okay, so let me now uh, conclude with uh, the logos, which uh, normally I have at the beginning, but I leave to the end. Uh, but uh, basically, these are institutes that I work with or collaborate with, and these are funding. Uh, those that, um, institutions that fund uh, my research. So thanks a lot to, 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 to you uh, here in the room and to all those that have been listening remotely. <laughs> <laughs>